And now we have lecture four. We're going to be talking about calorimetry, which means we are going to have to discuss a little bit of math. And this time we're going to have to actually do some math. And this is going to be the source of a lot of headaches for you. Calorimetry is the study of the movement of heat. Uh, calor is Latin for heat. Um, it's where we get the word for calorie. Um, calorie is actually a unit of energy. It's one that is really only used uh, um, by food companies and the government to, to measure how much energy is in food. Um, sometimes you'll, you'll find it in other branches of actual science, but we don't really use it all that much anymore because it's stupid and I hate it. That's why nobody else uses it either, because I hate it. They like me that much. All right, first we're going to have to explain this formula up top. Q equals SM delta T. It um, is fairly straightforward. Q just means heat. It's our old friend heat. It's uh, going to be measured in joules or kilojoules. Um, that's the thing you won't be able to measure directly. You will be able to measure temperature, not uh, Q. We're, we're usually looking to find Q. If not Q, then we're often looking to find our second friend here, S. Um, your textbook, I'm fairly sure, uh, actually calls this uh, C uh, with a, a little P underneath it. Um, and the rest of my slides might vary between the two. It, it really depends on what textbook you're using, uh, who you're talking to. When I learned it, it was CP, not S. Um, but you know, I, I sort of waffle back and forth because the classes I teach vary from one to the other. So for now, let's just go with S. Um, and S is just the specific heat capacity. And its units are joules per gram degrees Celsius. And explaining it in terms of the unit actually makes it uh, a little bit easier. Um, joules per gram degrees Celsius means that the specific heat capacity is how much energy it takes to raise the temperature of whatever substance you're looking at. Uh, if, if you have one gram of that substance and you want to raise the temperature one degree Celsius, that's how much energy it would take. That's the specific heat capacity, the relationship between the amount of energy you have to put into a certain amount of the substance and how much that temperature is going to go up. Uh, next up, we have mass. That's fairly straightforward. If you have more of a thing, it's going to take more energy to change the temperature. If you have less of a thing, it's going to take less energy to change the temperature. And the last one is delta T, uh, final temperature minus initial temperature. Uh, the greater the temperature change, the more energy moving in or out. And that's really all there is to it. And if it were really that easy, you guys wouldn't need me. But uh, let's go ahead and take a look at an example of, uh, of a specific heat capacity. Specifically, the specific heat capacity of water. Uh, water has a specific heat capacity of 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. You're probably going to get used to that number. It'll show up a lot. If you put 4.184 joules of energy into one gram of water, you'll raise the temperature by one degree Celsius. Or you could put 41.84 grams or joules of energy into 10 grams and raise the temperature by one degree Celsius. Or 41.84 joules of energy into one gram to raise the temperature by 10 degrees Celsius or 418.4 joules of energy to raise the temperature of 10 grams of water by 10 degrees Celsius. So, I mean, this is, it is somewhat straightforward. It's all multiplying, you know, one thing by another by another. More mass means more energy. More temperature change means more energy. So if you have just a really huge pot of water, it takes a really long time to put in enough heat to get it to boiling. This is, I hope, you know, at the very least, I hope that uh, nothing is, is, is jangling any chords uh, in, in terms of, you know, just being completely incomprehensible. So here's an example of a simple uh, problem. If you have 15.15 grams of iron and you pour in 50 joules of heat, 
uh, how much will the temperature change? Okay. I, I hope you'll forgive me for doing a simple slide. It's easier to edit it this way. Okay, so Q equals SM delta T. You just go ahead and do a little bit of algebra to rearrange that. Delta T equals Q over SM. Now, Q is equal to positive 50 joules. Like I said, we're putting in 50 joules of energy. That positive sign is important. Then uh, S is 0 0.44 joules per gram degree Celsius. It's far less than water. Water is really different compared to a lot of things. And 15.15 grams. You plug that into a calculator, you get a temperature change of 7.5 degrees Celsius. It's a fairly significant temperature change. Let's go ahead and compare that to what water would have done. You switch out the... Uh, 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 the specific heat capacity of water for that of iron, and you get a temperature change of 0 0.79 degrees Celsius, a little bit more than one-tenth uh, the temperature change. Water has a very high specific heat capacity. That's why you put your hand in water. It feels cold, and it keeps feeling cold, because it's able to just suck up all the heat that your hand is able to give it. Whereas you pick up a, a little bit of metal, you know, it'll feel cold at first. You, know, you put it back down, you pick it back up again, it doesn't feel cold the second time because it sucked up a lot of heat, or actually a small amount of heat, <laughs> I should say, very quickly in order to reach your body temperature. Okay. So uh, that is one of the things you can take away from this, hopefully, to try and get an understanding of specific heat capacity. A small or a low specific heat means uh, that it takes a small amount of energy to change the temperature of an object. Water has a very high specific heat capacity. That's why it's very easy to get hypothermia uh, in the water as opposed to out in the air. Because the air not only has a very low specific heat capacity, uh, but it also has very, very low mass. Okay, so it's better to stay dry when you're cold. Here's an example of a somewhat more challenging problem. What happens when you drop 5 grams of hot iron at 80 degrees Celsius into 10 grams of cool water at 20 degrees Celsius? So here's your scenario. Hot iron falling into cold water. In a manner that won't be too surprising to anyone, heat is going to flow out of the hot iron into the cold water. The temperature of the metal will come down, the temperature of the water will come up, until they're finally equal. That is what makes this problem solvable. Their final temperature is going to be the same. Okay, that is one of the fundamental laws of thermodynamics. Two uh, objects at different temperatures placed in thermal contact with one another will eventually reach the same temperature, somewhere in between the two. Okay? So the metal will lose heat until it reaches the final temperature. The water will gain heat until it reaches the final temperature. And here's the other thing you should pay attention to. All of the, met, uh, the, 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 the heat that leaves the metal is going into the water. All the heat that's going into the water is coming from the metal. That's it. Once again, equal in magnitude, opposite in sign. The heat lost by the metal is equal to the heat gained by the water. But because one is gaining and one is losing, they have opposite signs. Hence, you have to have that negative sign in front of one of them. It doesn't really matter which one. You'll still end up getting the same answer, just so long as you have a negative sign somewhere in there. And then it's just a matter of plugging in the definitions. Q equals SM delta T. Therefore, the heat lost by the metal is the specific heat capacity of iron multiplied by the mass of the iron multiplied by the change in temperature of the iron. The heat gained by the water is the specific heat capacity of water multiplied by the mass of the water multiplied by the change in temperature of the water. Just don't forget that negative sign. And delta T for both of them is going to be TF minus TI. It's just that they have the same final temperature and different initial temperatures. The final temperature of the metal and the water are going to be somewhere between the metal and the water. The initial temperature of the metal is 80 degrees Celsius. The initial temperature of the water is 20 degrees Celsius. 
So that is one thing you can check. For one of them, the final temperature will be lower than the initial temperature, giving you a negative delta T. For the other one, the final temperature will be higher than the initial temperature, giving you a positive delta T. That's where the minus sign comes from. From here on out, it's just a matter of algebra. You rearrange the equations to solve for final temperature. Notice that Tf appears on both sides, so it's not the most pleasant algebra, but still just algebra. I'll leave that as an exercise for the listener because it's kind of annoying but not too difficult. I expect you to be able to solve this sort of problem. And as yet another hint, your final temperature had darn well better be between 80 and 20 degrees Celsius. If you get a number anywhere outside that range, then you've done something really weird. If you get a number higher than 80 degrees, it means that somehow you've heated both the water and the iron, which is ridiculous and no, just no, okay? If you get somewhere below 20 degrees, well, that's not really impossible. They could both be in a really cold room, but that wasn't part of the information I gave you in the problem, so you still did something wrong. Okay, It should be somewhere between 20 and 80 degrees. 80 degrees. We're assuming no loss of energy anywhere in here. So it should be somewhere in between those two, closer to 20 than to 80, just because water has such a high heat capacity and twice the mass. Now I want to give you a quick heads up that uh, you can be a little bit more relaxed about uh, what you consider the system, what you consider the surroundings. So, for example, if you mix hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, you know, when they're dissolved in water, you'll get a neutralization reaction. They'll react, they'll release heat. Okay. What you should consider the system there would be uh, hydrochloric acid and the sodium hydroxide. The surroundings is the water they're dissolved in. Technically, you would consider the surroundings to be literally the rest of the universe, but for the you know molecules, the rest of the universe is so far away that you can sort of ignore it and just focus on the water. So what happens is the HCl and the NOH re react and release heat, and the water gets warm. Q is greater than zero because the hydrochloric acid and the sodium hydroxide are engaged in an exothermic reaction. They're releasing energy. Q is less than zero. So Q of the system is equal to negative Q of the surroundings. Delta H of the system is equal to negative delta H of the surroundings. And you can get the amount of energy or the delta H of reaction uh, just by measuring the temperature change of the water. Okay? And that it would be, you know, uh, a form of constant pressure calorimetry. And that is the sort of calorimetry you can do in a laboratory setting. Um, you know, you, you, you mix two things together in a calorimeter, you know, uh, something that will be fairly good at not losing energy to the rest of the universe. And by measuring temperature change, you can find the enthalpy of reaction. So, like I said, coffee cup calorimetry. Uh, because you're doing it in an open container on a lab bench and you want it to not lose heat to this rest of the universe. So, you know, a, a styrofoam coffee cup is not a terrible way to go for that sort of setup. Actually, it is kind of terrible compared to a 25,000. I miss some of those instruments. They were fun to play with. But, you know, compared to, you know, just throwing a water balloon at something, it, it is actually a fairly effective form of... Uh, uh, measuring things. And because it's an open container, constant pressure, so delta H equals Q, and thus all you need to do is measure the temperature change of the system. Uh, it's a quick and effective method of doing lab work, and it gets you a surprisingly good answer, so long as you're fairly careful about what you're doing. And our final slide, which will bring calorimetry to a close, is bomb calorimetry. Don't get too excited. It's called a bomb calorimeter because it's constant volume. That is to say, it's a closed container, a sealed container. And if you light something on fire inside of a sealed container, you've more or less made a bomb. But if it actually explodes, then you're doing very terrible <laughs> experimental work. Uh, you might be having fun. 
And you probably won't if you're not intending for there to be explosion. Now, uh, the calorimeter uh, for a bomb calorimeter acts as a an isolated system. Um, it's pretty much completely closed off from the outside. And you're no longer measuring enthalpy, but bomb calorimeters are usually very, very precise. Because if you've built something to not blow up, um, that could blow up, and you don't want it to, and so it's not going to blow up, um, then you've done a lot of work. And they can get you very good answers. Uh, the people who measure food calories use bomb calorimeters, for example. And the, some of the $25,000 machines I was working on were actually uh, very, very tiny bomb calorimeters. If those failed, then less of an explosion, more of just a very tiny mess inside a very expensive machine. Um, and the calorimeter for bomb calorimetry usually has its own uh, very precisely measured calorimeter constant. So instead of SM delta T, Q of the reaction is uh, the, the calorimeter constant, CCAL, uh, times the change in temperature. Uh, you get rid of mass uh, because it's uh, the bomb calorimeter, it's usually filled with a ton of water, you know, like several kilograms. It's the size of a fish tank. And that is far more than what you're burning inside of it. Um, so you'll see a very small change in temperature. They have very sensitive thermometers. And um, the mass of whatever you're burning is pretty much insignificant. Um, remember how I said before, uh, sometimes they use a, a C with a little P under it? Well, you see that here, CCAL. Uh, that's uh, sometimes still used as well. Uh, the negative sign, again, is because uh, you're talking about the reaction releasing heat into the surrounding water. So hopefully that uh, is no longer throwing you off. And that does it for this particular lab, at, uh, not lab, uh, lecture. And I will see you next time with a new set of slides.